Perfect. So as I was saying, um, sorry, somebody's not in mute. Um, can I just ask everyone to make sure they're in mute when they join the call, please? That's great. Thank you. Um, so yes, welcome back to Business Environments Lecture number three. Um, this week, we're going to be looking at the macroeconomic environment. So looking at the role of the government and how government decisions um, influence what a business does. So how does the government policies, how does the economic policies implemented by government influence how a business performs um, its strategic decision making or its decision making um, in, in any context. So what's today all about? Well, firstly, we're going to try and understand the government budget. Um, again, each country has their own financial system. Here in the UK, we have um, the budget, which is announced every six months or semi-annually by the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Um, which currently is Rishi Sunak under the Conservative government, and they are responsible for outlining where the government is going to be making the money, um, you know, with what the sources of revenue, both this year and for future years, and what types of government expenditure. So how is the Chancellor budgeting? How is the Chancellor balancing the needs of the economy by looking at where the government is spending money? There also is something which is called a budget outcome. Now, essentially, the budget outcome looks at, you know, is the government in a deficit, is the government in a surplus, and also what kind of stimulus package or um, or potentially um, moments of um, financial difficulty, we could say, that economy is going to face. So what kind of stimulus will, will there be from the government? Is the government planning to spend money in the economy? Or instead, is the government trying to save money to maybe pay off previous debts? So government budget is, is something we'll try to understand. On the flip side of the budget, we also have what's called fiscal policy. And the fiscal policy is something that, that, that isn't fixed. You know, it doesn't have to um, change every six months or, or any fixed period. However, there are certain um, criteria and there are certain milestones with fiscal policy too. So here in the UK, the Bank of England are responsible for controlling interest rates. Um, interest rates are set by the BOE and its, and its governors. Um, and that basically allows for some cotton of alteration to allow the economy to either grow or to or to to, to, to downsize. So I'll, I'll explain why that that is important. But basically, fiscal policy is whereby um, government and government departments, such as the bank, which is independent, it's not it doesn't belong to the government. The Bank of England acts independently. However, they are responsible for ensuring that the economy um, is performing the way they want it to. We also have what are called automatic stabilizers. Again, these will be explored in more detail throughout the slide deck. And finally, we'll look at the impact of fiscal policy on output, because fiscal policy is what tends to influence what a business does more than the government budget. Why? Because the government budget is, tends to be fixed. There's not too much change. Yes, companies may complain that the budget is unfair, et cetera, et cetera, but the government is responsible for a social good. So they're not necessarily always looking at businesses, although stuff like corporation tax, et cetera, et cetera, are always outlined in the government budget. So where are we looking at it from? So let's start by looking at fiscal policy. So fiscal policy, as I mentioned already, is a component part of macroeconomics. So we're talking here about the bigger scale picture, okay? We're looking here at the wider economy. We're not looking at a specific business. We're not looking at a specific market or an industry. We are looking at the wider economy. So everything um, that, that happens in a, in a country, you know, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's IT services, whether it's um, hospitality, whether it's um, leisure, you know, whatever it is, everything that um, happens in a country, everything that happens in an economy is measured um, through macroeconomics. So fiscal policy looks at macro level economics. It can also be referred to as budgetary policy. So again, don't get this confused with the government budget. The government budget is separate, but you may, excuse me, you may come across what's called a budgetary policy and that basically reflects what fiscal policy does and what fiscal policy is. Now, one of the primary functions of the government's role is to do what we say is stabilising the economy. So what does that mean? Well, basically, for example, in periods of high inflation, for example, where prices are going up and perhaps wages are, are staying cons constant or wages aren't reflecting the, the, the increase in prices, the government will want to try and 
try and mitigate the impact of that. Government doesn't want high inflation. High inflation means things are more expensive, people can't afford to buy, um, and it can lead to, to, to severe issues in the economy. So the government wants to suppress um, high inflation. So how do they do that? Well, they can look at a few different channels. They can maybe look at raising interest rates or through the Bank of England. So if the Bank of England raise interest rates, it means that um, people are more likely to save. So if you're not, if interest rates are higher, you want to save your money, earn interest, get more of a return on your investment. So people aren't spending, instead they're saving. Alternatively, the government might also want to set what's called a price cap. So for example, say the price of milk is rising and that's pushing up inflation. The government might say the maximum price for milk in this country will be one pound. So all of a sudden, nobody can raise the prices any further. So that stops the prices from going up. The government can do a lot of things that can, um, that can impact the economy. Now, you tend to find the government doesn't like to mess around with the free market. The government doesn't want to dictate prices, especially not in Western countries where we are more democratic. Um, there, there's a tendency for the government but not to interfere in market democracy. forces. Okay. I like so much, it's just so rubbish. Sorry, someone got a question? Yes. Yes, on you go. When you say that the Bank of England is a private organization uh -huh. what do you really mean how come it controls the budgetary policy of the uk mm -hmm. if it's a private organization that's a very good question so when i say when i say private i don't mean private as in profit they're not they don't have a profit orientation they're not a plc they're not a private limited company but what they are they're an independent body so the government doesn't necessarily control the bank of england the government doesn't tell the bank of england what to do the government Who may, does? it doesn't necessarily tell it encourages so the government has a role whereby if it sees inflation rising and may talk to the bank of england and say it's beneficial for the economy if we try and suppress inflation so it accepts the influences it encourages but the government isn't allowed to tell the bank of england they must take an action but the bank of england as an independent body okay whether or not the bank yeah. of england acts on the government's yeah, well, advice well, is completely um, different Sorry, I'm slightly confused. I understand your explanation, but what I'm asking is, if yes. the Bank of England is an independent body, yes, um, who constitute this body and who are the board of governors who appoint them? What is the capacity of the Bank of England in the representation within mm -hmm. the board of governors? Good question. Okay, very good question. So essentially the Bank of England exists to do what's called balancing the economy. The Bank of England is responsible for printing money. All money that's printed in the United Kingdom is done by the Bank of England. Um, all the private banks, all the corporate banks that exist in the UK, they are responsible for reporting into the Bank of England. So the Bank of England are basically a body that represent the collective of the banks, but they are independent. They don't exist to make a profit. The board of governors are usually elected they're elected from within the banking industry. Sorry, if, if you guys don't have a question, can you please go and mute? Thank you. I'm just trying to answer a question here. So if, if you, unless you're looking to ask a question, could you please go into mute? Um, sorry, yes, yeah, so come back to your question. <laughs> that represents the wider banking system in the United Kingdom. And that independent body is responsible for ensuring that the economy stays balanced. And how does it do that? Well, it does indeed, doesn't take instructions, but it certainly listens to what the government is saying. If the government is trying to control inflation, the Bank of England may decide to act themselves by saying, OK, let us help you by raising the interest. But they don't have to do that. They're not compelled by law to make the change the government is asking them. They are an independent body. Thank you. Okay, hopefully that helps answer your question. So yes, although they are an independent body, they may be influenced by the government. That's true. The government may say to them, can you help us control inflation by raising interest rates? And so the Bank of England will then decide between the board of governors whether or not that is something they want to do. And that happens every quarter, okay? So every quarter, the Bank of England's governors meet and they decide what to do with interest rates in the, in the, in the bank. So the Chancellor of Exchequer is a member of the uh, Board of Governors of Bank of England. Yes, ma'am? Uh, so the Chancellor of the Exchequer is different to everyone. So remember, there's two things. Let me go back to my previous slide. There's two things. 
what I mentioned here. So the Chancellor of the Exchequer is, is involved with what's called the government budget, okay? He or she, yeah. at the moment is he, um, sits on the on the government um, committee. So he or she is part of um, the cabinet that forms the UK government. So the Tory party have a cabinet. Boris Johnson is the Prime Minister. Rishi Sunak is the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Preeti Patel is the Foreign Sorry, the Home Minister. So we have lots of different um, roles on the Cabinet. So the Chancellor of the Exchequer sits as part of the government budget. He or she is responsible for reporting what the government wants. Okay, so right. that's where the Chancellor sits. However, for fiscal policy, we are looking more at the role of the Bank of England and independent organisations that act on behalf of the UK economy. Right, so the Chancellor is not part of the... Bank of England. No, it's no, not represented not. there. No, the, no. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank no you. Problem. Okay. Um. So next up, we have the primary functions. Well, as I've been saying already, one of the government's main roles is to try to stabilize the economy. Okay. If things are 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 um, or if the government sees the economy is suffering or the economy is growing or shrinking, the government might want to take action. So the government's role is to make sure the balance of the economy is there. Currently, as we speak, the government, UK government is pursuing a fiscal expansion policy. Why is it doing that? Well, it's increasing its expenditure while simultaneously reducing tax collection. You might be thinking, OK, so it's spending more, but it's making less. Why is it doing that? Well, obviously, we've just come out of a very, very difficult period. Or we're still in the difficult period, some will argue, with the coronavirus restrictions. The economy was shrinking and the government wanted to encourage people to start spending money. So they have started to make expenditure more attractive and also they've, they've reduced taxes as well so they've actually given people tax credits they've given people ways in which they can have more money to spend by reducing the impact they've also done things such as working with um, mortgage providers to ensure that people that default on their payments aren't at risk of losing their homes they've got an extended debt period so the government is trying to do what it what it can to to prevent people from suffering from financial losses okay so at this moment in time, that's the policy being pursued. That could change. The government may announce in the next budget it's going to do um, a fiscal contraction, which is when the government tries to save money. But at this moment in time, the UK government is following what's called a fiscal expansion strategy. And what it's doing is increasing the amount of money it spends while simultaneously reducing the amount of money that's coming in to try and encourage people to keep spending and to raise the economy. Now, there's a few different branches of economics that represent how that happens. And one of the key ones, or one of the, one of the, the popular models that are used is called Keynesian economics. Um, so the Keynesian economic model is where the government changes the level of tax and government spending so that it influences aggregate demand and the level of economic activity. So what do I mean by that? Well, basically, if the government, say for example, what's going today, it's putting taxes down, Okay, so tax levels are going down. People are not paying as much tax. What does that mean? That means they've got more money because they're not paying tax. They're saving more. They've got more money in, the, in their wallet. The government's also spending more, for example, on infrastructure. It's doing infrastructure projects by perhaps creating new roads, creating more bridges, creating more hospitals, and more schools. You know, the government's spending money. It's trying to get the economy stimulated. So there's more jobs. There's more construction work. There's more admin work, there's more opportunities. What does that mean? Well, that means there's more people in work, more people are saving money. That means they'll be more able to spend, okay? If the more money you have, the more disposable or real income you have to spend. And if you're spending more, you're raising what's called the aggregate demand, the demand for goods and services aggregated across all industries and all markets will go up. And if the demand is going up, it also means supply will go up as well because suppliers or businesses will be like, okay, there's more demand, let's make more products. And therefore it comes into a circle whereby the economy starts to grow. So I'll like try to explain that um, by annotating, okay? So let's take T to equal tax, okay? Let's take um, government spending to be GS. Then we have aggregate demand, which we will call AD. Okay. And then we have economic output, which we will call GDP. Okay. Gross 
domestic product that represents um, total economic activity, total economic output produced within a country. Now, if the tax level is going down, so tax is going down, what does that mean? Well, that means people have more money, yeah? Because they're not spending, they're not paying the government tax. They're saving a lot more, so they have more money in their back pockets. Simultaneously, the level of government spending, so the amount of money that government spends on the economy is going up, okay? Um, so the government are spending more money, but they're also putting taxes down. So what does that mean? Well, that means there's more opportunities because the government's spending on things like new buildings, new hospitals, new schools, um, they may be doing infrastructure projects. They're looking to perhaps increase the, the IT infrastructure, you know, the 5G network. They're trying to make more inclusive in the UK. They're trying to make internet connectivity better. So there's more jobs, there's more opportunities for people to work. What does that mean? Well, again, if, people are, if more people are working, that means there's more people with an income, more people are, are making money. If people are making money, they've got more money to spend, yeah? And if you're spending money, then the aggregate demand, which means total demand in the economy, must also go up. Because if you're spending more, that means you're buying more, which means the aggregate demand must be going up. If the aggregate demand is going up, it means that there is more money going around the economy, more people are spending, more people are buying. Businesses have more money coming in. They can then invest that money. They can then use that money to make new products. They can use that money to hire new workers, they can use that money to, 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 to continue growing their business. And that's what influences our gross domestic product, okay? So gross domestic product will also go up. So GDP goes up as a result. So that's the basic logic of what we call Keynesian economics. If the government does decrease tax and increase spending, then by default, the aggregate demand in the economy must also go up, therefore raising the GDP in the economy. But again, this is going into economics. The only reason I'm, I'm covering this with you is because it's important for you to understand how what the government does impacts business. So for example, the government changing levels of tax and government spending can have a net positive effect on gross domestic product. It means there's more money circling in the economy. It means businesses are able to spend more because they've got more money coming in. So what are the objectives of fiscal policy? Well, basically, it's development through what we call the mobilisation of resources. So the government wants businesses to be spending more. They want businesses to be hiring more people. They want more people to be skilled. They want more people to be available in the workforce. It's all about mobilising human resources. But it's not just human. It can also be capital. The government wants to make sure that people aren't just saving all of their money. Yes, savings are important. But if everyone starts saving and no one spends, then the economy is going to suffer because there's no one there to, to buy new products. There's no one there to sell new products to. So there's a bit of an issue. So the government don't want everyone to save. They want to strike the balance. They want to stabilize the economy so that, yes, there's some savings, but there's also some spending. It's all about mobilizing the, the, the resources within the economy. It also helps in reducing the inequalities in income and wealth. Now, that's a... That's a sticky subject because, as we all know, the gap between the rich and the poor in most countries, unfortunately, seems to be going, going up rather than going down. But the government is trying what it, say, it thinks is the best policy is to try and reduce those inequalities, to try and encourage people that are wealthier to spend more in taxes, to, to, to contribute more to the economy, and similarly to help those that are suffering to help those that don't have the finances, that don't have the income to, 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 to lead a better life by giving them incentives such as tax credits, by also giving them a lower tax rate, by perhaps offering benefits. So the government is trying to balance the inequalities, but unfortunately not enough is being done, some people argue, to counteract the growth and the inequality between the rich and the poor. We also have what's called price stability and control of inflation. So again, we talked about this already. If the government wants to make sure that prices of goods and services in the economy don't go up too much, it will try to discourage spending. How will it do that? It will speak to the Bank of England and it will say, inflation is going up, we need to do something. Is it possible for us to consider reducing, sorry, for us to consider increasing 
the interest rate. So why does the government want the Bank of England to raise interest rate? Because if interest rates are going up, people are more likely to save money. Similarly, if interest rates are going up, people that borrow money to spend can't do that as often. Why can they not do that? Because interest is higher, therefore the cost of borrowing has gone up. So in either case, the idea behind it is to stop um, expenditure and to encourage saving. We also have what's called employment generation. So again, we talked about this earlier when we talked about government spending. If government spending goes up on infrastructure, on projects, on um, building new schools, building new hospitals, well, what does that mean? That means there's more of a demand for construction work. For example, you need builders, you need people to do the plumbing, you need people to, to do the electrics in these buildings or these bridges, etc. So that means there's more job opportunities, okay? There's more employment being generated in the local area. There's also the idea of reducing the deficit and the balance of payment. So I'm not sure if you're all aware of what the balance of payment is, but basically in every country in the world, they have what's called a ledger or an account book, which measures how much money that country owes, how much money that country makes, okay? So what tends to happen is countries might be suffering during certain periods and they might ask for loans from other countries. They might look for a um, stimulus package. So for example, in 2008, in the financial crisis, um, certain countries in Europe had to, be, um, had to be saved from bankruptcy. So countries like Greece, um, almost Italy and Spain as well, to a degree, suffered from large financial losses, such that the economy was about to fail until the EU stepped in and the EU offered um, long-term loans to these countries to, 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 um, to stabilise their, their, their economy. Now, what does that mean? That means for these countries, they, got, they went into negative balance of payment. They had a deficit. They owe money back, in that case, to the EU. But in other cases, countries owe money back as well to, to other countries. Too. So we have what's called a balance of payment. And usually most countries, including some of the biggest countries in the world, such as the USA, the UK, um, Japan, India, um, China, all of these countries that have a lot of economic power are sometimes in debt. In fact, I think all of those countries I just mentioned currently have a negative or a deficit on their balance of payment. So they do actually owe money back um, to either a government body, to somebody in the economy, to, to the local bank. So for example, the UK government may borrow money from the Bank of England, um, and that means it owes money back. It's got a negative balance of payment. We also have national income. So national income measures how much money is raised through taxation, basically. Um, and because taxation is done as a percentage of income, we know roughly what the national income is based on tax. So the government wants to try and raise national income. It wants to try and ensure people are making more money and therefore in turn are paying more tax. So it's all about increasing national income in the country. And finally, developing infrastructure. So again, in order to encourage companies to invest in your country, you need to have good infrastructure, you need to have good supply chain, good logistics, you need to have road links, train links, air aircraft links. So countries that have good developed infrastructure are more likely to, to see inward investment from foreign companies. Com countries that don't have good infrastructure, they tend to struggle because if a company is looking to invest in your country or your economy, they want to have the the infrastructure, they want to have the resources in place so that they can run their business successfully. So these are some of the objectives of fiscal policy. So what goes into the fiscal policy? Well, obviously the budget has a role to play. So what the government announces and the budget will influence what the fiscal policy is. If the government announces that they're going to be spending more, well, that usually means that there will be some form of inflation at some point. It usually means that the fiscal policy might be needed to influence interest rates. Um, so these are all things that are important. The level of tax. So again, if the government raises or drops tax levels, that will have an influence. The public level of public expenditure. So how much money is being spent on public initiatives, such as building new schools, new hospitals, um, on council services, on um, better linkages, better transport links, etc. So these are all public forms of expenditure. Um, and finally, public debt. How much money does the country owe? 
So the debt level is also something that is measured under fiscal policy. Okay, these are all things that are used or they're called instruments within the fiscal policy bracket. Right, so it's going to get a little bit complicated here, so I need you to bear with me while I try to explain what's going on here. So if you remember, we looked at um, supply and demand last week. So before we do anything else, I want you to look at the black line on this graph and let me just annotate it, okay? So this line here is your aggregate demand, okay? So this is a demand curve. This line, the blue line, is your aggregate supply so it's a supply curve. So you've got demand, you've got supply, you've got a certain price, and the price at which this line intersects is your um, equilibrium price, okay? So with fiscal policy, changes in the level of government spending and tax that are aimed at either increasing or decreasing the level of aggregate demand in an economy to promote macroeconomic objectives so what does that mean? It means fiscal policy is a demand side policy. Why is it demand side? Because fiscal policy looks at changing the level of demand in an economy. How can that be done? Well, if the government's spending more money, therefore there's more projects, there's more work, and there's more opportunities, demand will go up. If the government's spending less money, there's less opportunities, less projects, there's less um, demand for goods and services, less demand for labor, then demand will go down. Okay, so. Fiscal policy is a way of influencing what happens to demand. Now, at the point at which aggregate demand intersects aggregate supply, we have what's called a long run aggregate supply curve, okay? So that means in a normal economy with normal conditions, good growth rate, you know, there's no COVID restrictions, there's no economic crisis. This is the ideal situation you want to end up with a fairly stable supply curve so that the government has control. Government is able to make sure that the, the economy is balanced. Aggregate supply might not be exactly straight, but it will be fairly constant. There's a good level of supply. It meets the demand. Everyone is happy, okay? Suppliers are able to supply at that price. There's good demand at that price. Everyone's happy. However, sometimes what can happen and what tends to happen is aggregate demand will fall no matter what the government does even if the government does um try to increase expenditure people will be more likely to save sometimes so for example um if you think back to the economic crisis some countries took longer than others to emerge from the crisis okay some were affected as much which is true but even countries that were affected heavily they had different rates of recovery the usa was probably more affected than the uk however the US recovered a lot faster, whereas the UK took longer to recover from the economic crisis. Why is that? That's because aggregate demand, this curve here, aggregate demand curve was falling. Despite the government's efforts to try and raise it, aggregate demand in the economy went down. Why did it go down? Because the UK consumers lost trust in the banking industry. Okay, it didn't trust what the banks were doing. It didn't trust what the banks were saying. The demand, People, even though banks were dropping interest rates to encourage people to spend more, to borrow more money, people didn't want to borrow more money. People didn't want to take on more loans and more debts. People wanted to just stick with what they had. So aggregate demand fell in the UK and it took longer for it to recover and return to more normal levels. So in this case, the government was aiming for this. The government was aiming to have a long run supply, aggregate supply up here. But because the UK consumers were not comfortable, they didn't trust the banking system, they didn't trust that the economy would recover as much as the government wanted it to, aggregate demand fell. And what did that mean? It meant real GDP in the UK also fell. So that just demonstrates that despite what governments might try to do and not do, it depends on the, the reaction of the economy whether or not people go along with what the government's trying to do or whether people refuse to stick to what the government's doing. Okay. Let's then move on to the budget. So the budget is a detailed plan of operations for some specific future period. So as we said already, the budget is presented by the Chancellor of the Exchequer here in the UK. 
So remember, the Chancellor of the Exchequer is part of the government. He or she sits in the cabinet. They form government. They're part of the, the, the governing party. We also sometimes hear the budget being referred to as the annual financial statement for the country. So again, um, the Chancellor of the Exchequer will present the, the, the basically the accounts for the country. It will present where money is coming in and where money is going out. That also covers the requirements for expenditure on defence, internal security and other necessary expenditures as adequately provided. So again, stuff like national defence, the army, the navy, all of these things are funded by the government. The government is responsible for paying for them. Um, so there's a lot of expenditure that goes into uh, running an economy. So what about the government budget and revenue sources? Well, fiscal policy puts the government's budget into action to stimulate or contract aggregate demand as needed. So what does that mean? Fiscal policy has the, the ability to put the government plan into action. It can stimulate, which means grow, or it can contract, which means shrink aggregate demand as required. Then the budget is simply a combination of revenues earned from taxes and expenditures made by all goods and services by a nation's government in a year. So that's what it is, okay? And in a very simple term, it combines all the revenue that the government has earned from its taxes, and it measures all the expenditures on goods and services by the government all within the one year. So how does the government make its revenue? Well, predominantly it comes from tax. Almost all, if not most, of government revenue um, is made through taxation, whether that's income tax at the individual level, whether it is um, corporation tax at the business level, whether it is um, inheritance tax or allowance. So what happens when someone dies and they pass on their estate? Well, the government takes a percentage. So it's, there's inheritance tax. There is um, other taxes such as self-assessment tax. So again, if you're self-employed, you, you pay a, a different tax rate. So again, it's all these different taxes that the government um, makes um, from, from people in, living in that country. Some of these are called direct taxes. So what are direct taxes? These are taxes on things like income that are earned by household and firms. So direct tax means a certain percentage. No matter how much you earn, you pay a certain percentage. But that certain percentage can vary. And that's what happens in countries such as the UK, the US, and other countries around the world. So basically, we have what's called a progressive tax system in the UK. So the percentage that you pay in tax will go up as a proportion of how much you earn, okay? So if you're earning between, in the United Kingdom, if you're earning between zero pounds and 12,500 approximately at this moment in time, you pay zero tax, okay? That's part of your tax-free allowance. You don't have to pay a penny of tax on up to 12,500 pound worth of income. After 12,500 pound, all the way up to 40,000, I believe, you pay 20% tax. So of that proportion of income between 12 and a half and 40,000 pound, you have to pay 20% tax. From 40,000 pounds all the way up to 50,000 pounds, I believe it's 40% or 30%, I think. And then from 50,000 and above, it is 40% tax. So the level of tax in the UK changes, goes up or down, depending on how much money you earn. So it's called a progressive tax system. The idea is people that earn more, people that are richer on paper should be paying more. People that earn less, people that are poorer, we should be paying less. There's also what's called an indirect tax. So indirect tax are those taxes on, for example, the consumption of goods and... Apologies, I just sneezed. Um, so indirect tax are taxes on things like consumption of goods and services. For example, in the UK, you pay what's called VAT. VAT is a goods and services tax, or GST. So you have to pay that percentage on goods and services consumed. Currently in the UK, VAT um, sits at one-fifth, 20%, okay? So 20% of everything you buy and sell, goods and services, are, are entitled to be paid VAT on.
What about other sources of revenue available to the government? Well, there are other sources, and these probably aren't used very often, but they are available. For example, the sale of goods and services. The government may wish to sell some of its assets. The government has a lot of assets, including public property. Um, so the government may decide if it's struggling financially, if it's not raising enough taxes, or if the economy is suffering and it needs more money, then it might decide to sell some of its assets. Sale of government property. So it's not just the private property, it's public property. Um, so again, the government may decide, not that it will, but for example, imagine the government decided that it wanted to downsize its, its um, parliament. So it might sell the Houses of Parliament in London. I don't think it will, but it's just an idea. So government property can be sold. And finally, it might privatise state-owned enterprises and to private investors. Now, there's not very many state-owned enterprises left in the UK. A lot of it has been privatised. But for example, if you think to the Royal Mail, if you think um, British Telecommunication, BT, um, if you think, um, what else is the trains, yes, the trains were also state owned. So these are all examples of industries that have now been privatized in the UK. They're now run by private enterprise. They're no longer run by um, the government. So because the government has privatized, it sold those services to um, private businesses or private investors. What about expenditure? So where does the government spend its money? So government expenditure is made by um, the government on behalf of the collective needs and wants of an economy, such as providing pension. So when we retire, when we get old and we're no longer able to work, the government will look after us. By collecting tax, they will then be paying out a pension. So they'll be paying for us um, in the future. They will also provide certain benefits, certain um, level of living. So for example, if you're living in poverty or if you're struggling to make ends meet, here in the UK, the government will provide you with benefits. The government will provide you with school meals. If you're a young child, the government will provide you with certain level of goods and services such that your life um, conditions are not below a certain level, okay? So the government will try to provide for you. The government will also spend on infrastructure. So as we said already, um, stuff like hospitals, schools, roads, bridges, there's a current project going on at the moment called HS2, High Speed Rail 2, um, and that will connect London to Birmingham and Manchester in, in, in next no time. So the idea is to improve infrastructure, to improve travel and links between London and some of the more remote places um, of the UK that are perhaps not as as, as well regarded. So London is seen as the, as the financial powerhouse, but there are other cities, for example, Birmingham, Manchester, Glasgow, Edinburgh, and Cardiff. These cities in the UK have a big role to play in the UK economy. So it's about making sure they're also connected. Public expenditure creates a big proportion of aggregate demand. So when we talked about aggregate demand being the total demand for goods and services in an economy, well, a lot of it is made up by the government. The government demands a lot um, of the goods and services in a country. The government demands um, work. The government demands um, projects to be created so that there is more opportunities in the, in the economy. So the government, create, government spending is an important part of aggregate demand in the UK economy. And public expenditure also includes revenue expenditure and capital. So what do you mean by that? So revenue expenditure tends to be expenditure done to support people in their living. So for example, tax credits, people that are on low incomes, they could get entitled to tax credits in the UK. But there's also what's called capital expenditure. And that's the government spending on fixed assets, such as building high speed rail too, such as building bridges, building hospitals, building schools. These are seen as long term capital investments that will make a return for the government, you know, educating more people, um, having more healthcare facilities and hospitals, creating better transport links. These are all seen as capital expenditures, okay? Again, different types of expenditure. Why is this important? Because you need to know how the government spends its money because how the government spends its money will influence what a business does. So we have what's called current expenditure. These are everyday costs that the government has. For example, paying the wages and salaries of public employees, such as teachers, the police, 
the military, judges, etc. People that are employed by the government, um, the government has to pay their wage. So there's current expenditure. Capital expenditure we already talked about. This is stuff like big money expenses, building new roads, bridges, schools, hospitals, military equipment, courthouses, etc. etc. And finally, we have what's called transfer payments. So transfer payments basically are a type of government spending that doesn't necessarily contribute to your GDP. Why is that? Because income is only transferred from one group of people to another. So what, what's a transfer payment? So a transfer payment is basically the government's way of trying to reduce inequality in the UK. So that can include things like welfare and unemployment benefits. So the government provides these benefits. How are these benefits provided? Well, basically through income tax. People that are working pay tax. That tax is used to pay people that perhaps aren't working or people that are struggling in life, people that can't work. They are getting payments. They're getting money to support them. So that's why we call it a transfer payment. The money is basically transferred by the government from one group of people, those being taxpayers, to the other group of people that perhaps aren't able to work, don't have the facilities to work, um, and they are getting money from the government that way. Okay, so transfer payments is basically benefits provision and um, the government supporting less able people in the economy. Coming back to the government budget. So again, a government's budget can either be balanced, it can be in surplus, or it can be in deficit. So in an ideal world, the government wants it to be a balance. Why does it want to be a balance? It basically wants all money coming in to be equal to all money going out. Why? Because as always, the government is not here to make a profit. The government here is here to present, represent the people of the country. The government is here to help people of the country get the goods and services and, and, and meet the needs of the people. So the government wants to make sure that all of its expenses are equal roughly to all of its revenues. That means that you know all the leakages, so all the taxes that are collected are equal to all the injections, all the money going back into the economy. And the government doesn't want to be seen as someone that's hoarding the revenue. The government wants to be seen as someone that's apportioning the revenue to the necessary parts of the economy that require it. Okay, so all money coming in, an ideal world will be equal to all money going out of the government. However, that can be very difficult to achieve. In some years, this will happen. We have what's called a budget surplus. So why does that budget surplus happen? Well, basically the government may be suffering from high levels of national debt. So the balance of payment is a negative equity. The government has a, a balanced deficit. So in order to reduce the level of national debt and pay off some of the country's debtors, the government may decide to raise taxes and may decide to stop spending as much on expenditure. Therefore, number of leakages, number of monies coming out of the economy is greater than number of monies going into the economy, not so that government can make a profit, but so the government can use that money to pay off some of the debt. Okay, so for example, right now I've told you the UK government is pursuing a financial ex financial expansion strategy, which means it's collecting less tax and putting in more money into the economy. That they're only doing that by raising debt. The debt in the UK is going up, so the government can spend more. At some point, the government will need to pay that debt back. So at some point, the level of taxes will probably go up, the level of spending will go down, and people will be expected to pay tax to try and pay off the debt. Okay. Similarly, so in some cases, we have what's called a budget deficit. Now, a budget deficit happens when there's a greater expenditure than tax, and that's what we're currently going through. And we're going through a budget deficit. The UK government is making less money than it is spending. And therefore, we are raising the level of national debt. The government is having to borrow more money and pay um, more into the economy that way. Nation, what is a national debt? Well, a national debt, as we said already, is a balance of payment. It basically is a debt in the sum of all of its past deficits minus all of its past surpluses. If the number is negative, it means the government has borrowed more money over the years to finance um, and it's not yet paid back the accumulated surpluses. Okay, so the government has not yet paid back its debt. The surpluses are less than the deficits. Here is a chart which kind of gives you a representation of 
how aggregate demand looks in countries across the world. So countries like Denmark, um, Sweden, Netherlands, they tend to have a fairly strong aggregate demand. Okay, the government sector tends to be quite well positioned. So the, in these countries, consumption at a GDP level is quite strong. Government spending is quite high. In these countries, the government likes to spend money. They like to invest in the economy. Investment levels are okay. I mean, there is some investment and net exports are positive. That means they are exporting more to the rest of the world than they're importing in. Whereas if you look at countries like Israel, you have countries like Mexico, Georgia, and to a certain degree, the USA, these countries have a lot more consumption. Consumption makes a large part of their GDP. Investment is okay, but it's fairly limited. There's not too much investment going in. Government spending is relatively low compared to other countries such as Denmark, Sweden, Netherlands, France, Germany. Government spending in the part and parts of Europe is a lot higher than the government spending in Israel, Mexico, Georgia, the US. And net exports are negative. That means these countries are importing more than they export. So a number of goods and services coming into the country, so they're paying more money out than they're getting back in. So net exports in these countries tend to be lower. So again, just to give you an idea of how different countries have different systems, there's nothing to say that any of these systems is wrong. It's just that each government has its own policy. It has its own way in which it wants to balance the economy. Um, some follow different paths. So this just gives you an idea of how it works. And as you can see, the size of the government sector relative to a nation's economy can vary greatly from each country to country. So in countries like Denmark, Sweden, Netherlands, France, Germany, even Austria and Italy, the government spending makes up a larger part of GDP. A lot of the aggregate demand in those countries comes from the government. Whereas in countries like Israel, Mexico, US, Colombia, Malaysia, Switzerland, and Brazil, it's more of a public expenditure. It's more about consumption. People spending makes up a larger part of aggregate demand. So what are some of the rules of fiscal policy? So the government spending as a proportion of total aggregate demand if we study the chart to the right that we just looked at, we noticed that government spending is the largest component of GDP for countries on the left. So countries like Denmark, Sweden, Germany, France, Italy, and it's much smaller for countries um, on the right-hand side. So countries like Mexico, Israel, Brazil, the USA, Georgia, um, GDP was mostly made up of public consumption. So in a country where the government is spending a larger component, the impact of fiscal policy can be greater where it is a smaller proportion of GDP. So what does that mean? Well, if the government spending is bigger, then fiscal policy has a bigger control over the economy than overall GDP because the government is pushing for aggregate demand. Whereas if it's the opposite, if public consumption has a bigger role, then the public have more control if people stop spending, then the economy might suffer. So recessions and periods of ugly economics, we talked about this already, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. But again, what might happen during a recession? Well, aggregate demand will fall. That's what we saw in the UK. Aggregate demand fell because people didn't trust the banks. Therefore, you know, the, the price equilibrium and the GDP, there was a fall. And this was, a, this was the recession. GDP fell for consecutive quarters. And therefore, the UK went into a recession, as did many other economies in the world, but the UK took a long time to emerge because the gap was quite big. Okay. The multiplier, I don't want you to worry about the multiplier, but the multiplier basically allows us to work out the size of growth. So how much will one pound spent by the government grow the economy? The multiplier lets us do that. So in order to work out this multiplier, it's one over one, take away the MPC. Now you're probably thinking, what is the MPC? Well, the MPC is the multiplier, um, the multiplier, spending multiplier, so it's yeah, the size of the spending multiplier, okay? So that's what the MPC stands for. So if we study this graph here, the level of the economy in the left is producing a level of output at $500 million, okay? So we have $500 million. 
below the full employment level. So at the full employment level, the long run aggregate supply, we would have this level. However, at this moment in time, this economy is suffering. So it's $500 million less. Okay. If we assume that the marginal propensity to consume, so for every $1 spent, 0 0.75 is consumed. That's the marginal propensity to consume. Then in order to work out our spending multiplier, we would do one over one takeaway 0 0.75. And that'll tell you what the spending multiplier is. So how much of $1 spent will be spent? So if the government wishes to stimulate spending by returning enough to the economy to fill employment, how much would they have to spend? Let me tell you just now. So here is how you would do that, okay? So spending multiplier would be 1 over 1 take away 0 0.75, which means number 4. So for every $1 spent by the government, 4 more are spent in the economy. So if the government raises its expenditure by $1, there'll be four more dollars generated in the economy because of how the cycle works. So in order for you to reach a $500 million um, the deficit, so in order to cover this $500 million, the government would have to spend $125 million. So $500 million divided by the uh, multiplier, four, gives you 125 why? Because a 125 million pound increase in government spending should stimulate a total demand in the economy by $500 million, and it will help shift the aggregate demand back to its full employment level. Now, again, how is this important to business environment? Because if a business is looking to employ people, if a business is looking to recover from an economic recession, if a business is looking to, to find its feet after a period of low growth, it will look to the government to try and stimulate the economy. So the business needs to know what the government is doing. Well, how is the government behaving? Why is the government making certain changes? These are, these are little things that businesses need to be aware of so that they can plan ahead. If you can tell what the government is doing, you can then plan ahead and understand how your business can cope going forward. In some cases, the government might want to expand the economy so the government might want to reduce taxes to increase aggregate demand what will it do here you will do what's called the negative of marginal propensity so it's not about spending it's about saving so it's minus the mpc over difference so minus 0 0.75 over 0 0.25 the difference between 0 0.75 and 1 equals minus 3 so what does that mean that means in order to in order for the government to make the fiscal expansion it would need to decrease taxes by 167 million dollars so you can either increase spending by 125 million and that will recover the 500 million lost or the government can decrease taxes by 167 million and that will also recover the 500 million that's been lost in the economy right that was quite heavy going any questions on this part here did everyone follow this Anyone not sure and wants to ask a question? No? Okay, well, it's 11 o'clock. It's been an hour of me talking. Let's take a quick five minute break. Give you a chance to stretch your legs, get some fresh air. And we will resume in five minutes time and we'll start looking at the markets and how government affects what goes on in the markets. OK, so five minute break. Um, if anyone has any questions, please just save them for after the break now and you can ask them when we come back. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Um, so as I said, we had a fairly um, heavy session before the break, um, looking at um, fiscal policy and looking at some of the kind of technical instruments that sit underneath and explore the role of the government within um, aggregate demand and supply. Any questions over the break or anything anyone want to, wants to ask and then have a chance to reflect on the morning session? No? Are you all pretty happy? All pretty clear? I'll take that as a yes. So what we're move, moving on to for the rest of today is looking at um, markets. Okay, we're looking to understand, well, what does that mean for markets? Well, basically, firstly, what is a marketplace? So a marketplace is anywhere where goods and services are purchased. So essentially, there's no tangible way to describe it, but a marketplace is anywhere where you sell goods and services. That could be a local market, it can be a domestic market, an international market, it can be global financial market. All of these markets are where goods and services are sold in some way, shape or form. However, specifically in economics, we will use the word markets to explain an arrangement which establishes effective relationships between buyers and sellers of a commodity. Okay, so we're looking at one specific thing so a market for keyboards, a market for mobile phones, a market for laptops, a market for cars. So we don't have, for us in markets, we have to look at a specific component, we have to look at a specific commodity. We can't have markets to represent everything in the one go. So in economics, it's all about modeling. In order to model something effectively, you need to model each, each individual market separately for each commodity. So for us, each commodity has its own market. There's a different market for mobile phones, a different market for um, televisions, a different market for laptops, a different market for furniture. So all of these things have different markets, okay? What are the characteristics of um, markets? Well, you can participate in both as a buyer and a seller within a market. What does that mean? Well, for example, say you are looking to buy a new house. In order to buy a new house, you must first sell your old house. So in the market for houses, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to sell your house. Once you've sold your house and you know you've got finances coming in, you can then buy a new house. So in that case, you are both a buyer and a seller in the same market. Okay, so as a person that participates in a market, you can be both a buyer and a seller. It does not refer to a particular place or location. So again, a market doesn't have to be a physical place that you can see or stand or, or touch. A market can be an online market. So for example, eBay, Amazon, these are all marketplaces. So markets don't have to be in a physical place or a location. It refers to the institutional relationship between purchases and sellers. So basically, Although there's nothing written down per se, although there will be, because in order to sell on Amazon, you have to sign up to Amazon's terms and conditions. In order to buy from Amazon, there's certain conditions that you as a buyer have to fulfill. But there's no real contracts in terms of you don't necessarily have to know the buyer or know the seller in order to transact, okay? It's more of an institutional relationship, just a mutual respect almost between you and the seller or between you and the buyer. The market is an arrangement that links buyers and sellers. So again, just as eBay and Amazon do, markets in economic terms do the exact same thing. It's a place that buyers and sellers come together to negotiate or to barter or to sell or buy goods and services. Now, the market differs from one another due to differences in number of buyers, the number of sellers, nature of the product, influences over price, availability of information, et cetera, et cetera. So what does that mean? Well, basically, for example, the, the market for a mobile phone may have many more buyers than a market for a Ferrari, for example. Only certain people can afford a Ferrari. Only certain people want a Ferrari. Um, so again, markets are very, very different. The same number of people buying a Ferrari will not be the same number of people buying a mobile phone. I mean, much less than Ferrari, much more for a mobile phone. So again, each market has different characteristics. For us in economics, when we're looking at market structures, there's four that we really um, concern ourselves with. The first one is a perfect competition situation. 
Second one is a monopoly market. Third one is a monopolistic competition. And finally, we have an oligopoly. And I'm going to explain each of these four in turn, but these are important because these influence the business environment. If you're a business looking to join the market, then you don't want to join something that's a monopoly because then there's one player dominating. Similarly, if you are a big player in the market and you have the opportunity to become a monopoly, would, why would you want to be one? Again, we're going to look at reasons as to why being a monopoly is good and in some cases bad. So we're going to discuss these in the next um, uh, hour, hour and a half. So market structure, as I said already, there is four key ones we look at, but they aren't the only four. So there's actually six altogether. Um, there's perfect and, and imperfect competition. There's monopoly and monopolistic competition. There's oligopoly, and then there's what's called a duopoly. Now, these are all important, but under the imperfect competition, you'll see here we have what's called monopolistic competition. We have oligopoly and we have duopoly. The reason why imperfect competition is split into more levels is because there's different forms of imperfect competition. Monopoly means one firm dominates. Perfect means everyone is well informed. There's lots of different suppliers, sorry, lots of, lots of different sellers and lots of different buyers. Okay, that's perfect competition. Um, people compete against each other. That's a good thing. Monopoly it might not always be a good thing for you if you're a buyer, but certainly for a seller, if you're a monopoly, you're the only firm in the market, you have a lot of control. Those are the two extreme situations. However, unfortunately, the nature of the world, the nature of the economy, the nature of the world we live in today is such that we usually end up in somewhere that's called imperfect competition. So we either end up with monopolistic competition, we end up with oligopoly, or we end up with duopoly. So let's look at all of these in more detail. So as I said already, the most competitive markets where there's lots of buyers, lots of sellers, is all the way to the left. It's called perfect competition. The least competitive or the least um, favorable markets, we could say, are the ones all the way to the right. They're monopolistic, okay? There's a monopoly going on. Um, there's not very many sellers and probably lots of buyers looking to buy from the same supplier. However, as I said already, the world isn't perfect. Therefore, we usually end up somewhere in the middle with something that's called a monopolistic competition, an oligopoly or a duopoly. So let's look at the characteristics or the typologies of market structures. So with perfect competition on the left-hand side, we have lots and lots of small sellers, small firms. We have lot, no barriers to entry, so it's easy for people to join the market. If you're looking to sell, if you're looking to buy, there's no barrier for you to enter that market. It's fairly simple. You can join at any time. There are, homo, there are homogenous products. What does that mean? Well, that means there are products that are similar. There's not too much difference. You know, ev everyone is well informed about the products. You know, there's no, there's no one product that's better than the others. They're all vaguely the same. The firm is the price taker. What does that mean? Well, that means the firm or the business that's doing the selling they don't necessarily get to decide what price is going to be charged. It depends on what the demand is. The demand is horizontal in this market. Everyone knows everything about this market. Everyone knows the price of goods and services. Everyone knows the features and benefits. Everyone has access to all the information. It's perfect competition. There's lots of sellers. Therefore, the demand will be horizontal. It will be the same all the way through. And the supply line will cut the demand at the point at which people are willing to pay that price, okay? So that's perfect competition. Ideally, that's a situation that all countries aim towards. They want to have lots and lots of sellers and they want to have a good level of knowledge of each product and service so that people can make informed decisions. However, that doesn't always happen because as I said, the world's not a fair place. What sometimes tends to happen and we tend to see more often than not is what's called monopolistic competition. So again, there's lots of small firms, so there's lots of people selling. There will be some entry barriers. What does that mean? So for example, if you decided tomorrow that you wanted to start selling soft drinks, yes, you could do that, but big companies such as Pepsi, such as Coca-Cola, um, they will have what's called high barriers to entry. In order for you to compete against them, you will need to have A, a lot of finance, and B, you will need to quickly market and aggressively market. So they've already got an advantage over you. They've got a high barrier to entry. Anyone looking to come into that market would probably struggle to break the dominance of 
Pepsi or a Coca-Cola. So there are some entry barriers. There are differentiated products. So there are different products, which is good. The firm has some control over the price. So again, the likes of Pepsi and Coca-Cola, no, they can't decide whatever they want to charge, but they do have some control. If they raise the price by 10 pence or 20 pence, chances are customers will pay it because they like Coca-Cola, they like Pepsi, they've got a good following, they've got a good um, base of customers that, that, that like their product. They can afford to raise the price or change the price without it affecting demand too much. What happens in this situation? The demand curve is downward sloping, okay? So any significant increase in the price would affect the demand, but any small increase would probably just result in a shift in the demand curve. So monopolistic competition tends to be the, 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 the state of play in most um, markets here in the West world. We then have what's called an oligopoly. Now this you don't see very often, but this is, for example, the oil industry. The oil industry very much is an oligopoly. There's some big key players in the oil industry. Gazprom, um, there's a Chinese company as well, I believe, I can't remember the name. There's um, Royal Dutch Shell. There is um, the US company. Um, so there are a few different ones that, that, that dominate the market. There are usually significant barriers to entry. So it's very, very difficult for a new company to join. If you are trying to create a new oil um, extracting company, then in order for you to even try to compete with these companies, you will need to overcome some significant barriers. They've been working together or against each other for many, many years. They've come up with ways in which to restrict anyone else joining. So it will make your life very difficult. There'll be lots of entry barriers to prevent you from becoming as big as them. Products will be differentiated or undifferentiated. So it just really depends, okay? Um, oil, for example, is quite similar. I mean, yes, it's different quality of oil, different quantity of oil, but generally speaking, oil is oil. What tends to happen with this type of product is it's downward sloping, but it's price inelastic. That means even if the price goes up, we just have to pay it. We need the product to survive. We need oil to heat our homes. We need oil for our cars. We need oil to, 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 to make different products. So as we've seen, sometimes oil prices go up, sometimes oil prices go down. It's an oligopoly situation. And we as the customers have to pay what the price is. Otherwise we can't run our cars. We can't heat our homes, okay? So oligopoly is something that happens not very often, but it happens in some industries such as the oil industry. And finally, we have what's called a monopoly market. Now, monopoly markets are very, very difficult to achieve in the Western world. Why? Because Western governments try to restrict or prohibit monopolistic behavior. They don't want one company dominating. They want there to be some competition. So what happens in monopoly? Well, in monopoly, there's one firm that dominates the market. Um, that one firm has created very high barriers to entry. It makes it very, very difficult for anyone else to try and compete. In fact, nobody can compete against them. They're that big, they're that strong, that they will just destroy you, okay? Some people argue that Google is an example of a monopoly in their market area. No one can really compete with Google. Uh, Google is the search engine of choice for billions of people across the globe. Um, so you could argue perhaps Google is becoming a monopoly, but there is certain sanctions in place by the US government that looks to control what Google can and can't do. Google or a monopoly firm would have considerable control over the price. Now, again, what tends to happen in a monopoly is because you're the biggest player, you're the only player in the market, you can charge whatever price you want. Customers don't tend to have much of an alternative. They'll have to pay it. Similarly with Google, Google is the biggest search engine provider and search engine optimizer. If you're a business trying to advertise, advertising on Google is probably your best bet to reach lots and lots of people. Google is the biggest search engine provider. Therefore, they can charge almost any price and a company, if they want to be serious about the marketing, will have to pay it, okay? So considerable control over price. And what happens in that situation to demand curve? Well, the demand curve is downward sloping. Obviously, as the price goes higher, the demand will start to fall but it's more inelastic. So again, whilst demand will fall, people will have no option to pay it because they don't have any alternative. They still need to market their products. They still need 
um, access to that the good or service that can't really be provided by anyone else. So again, monopoly is the extreme situation. With a monopoly, there is no competition. With perfect competition, there's lots and lots of competition. Everything is great. Unfortunately, neither of those tend to happen very often. We usually end up with monopolistic competition. That's the most common in most industries. But sometimes we end up with an oligopoly where a few large firms dominate the market. So again, what does the demand curve look like? So with perfect competition, here is what happens. We have a downward sloping demand curve and an upward sloping supply curve. They meet in the middle at equilibrium price, equilibrium quantity. And at this moment in time, we would say the price is equal to the demand, which is equal to um, the marginal um, consumption. Okay, so everything is equal at this point. We have a, we have a straight... Um, we have a straight demand curve. It's a horizontal demand curve. Everything that's demanded at this level will be supplied. In a perfect market, we have homogenous products that are very, very similar. Everyone knows what they are. There's free entry and exit. We have perfect knowledge of the price and the technology. There is no artificial restrictions. There are large buyers and sellers, and we have no transport. Everything is clear, okay? Perfect competition is an ideal situation. As I said, it's not always possible, but um, it is a, an ideal situation. So if it satisfies the following, which we've already discussed, you could say a market has reached perfect competition. And that's what every government really aspires to get. The government wants there to be lots of competition. The government wants consumers, people, citizens to have lots of choice, and they want businesses to compete. They want businesses to compete against one another, to try and win business, trying to stay efficient. And that's really today's session, guys, okay? Um, that, there's nothing much more for me to cover today other than to explain to you that for a business, you need to try and work out what your industry sector is at, okay? Is it perfect competition? If it is, great. It means you, as a new business, can enter it without any um, entry barriers. You have the ability to be able to compete on equal footing. You have access to a large number of buyers. However, unfortunately, the nature of today's world and the nature of the economy worldwide is such that perfect competition almost cannot exist. We always end up with a form of competition. So, for example, we have monopolistic, we have um, oligopoly, we have duopoly, or in extreme state cases, in some countries in the world, there is monopoly situations where one company has the most power. Um, and again, that company tends to be able to charge or extort its customers any way it sees fit. So today we looked at the role of the government and what the government can do to influence the amount of money in the economy. We then started looking at market structure and how the market impacts businesses' decisions. But what did we learn for businesses that we can take away? Well, firstly, the business needs to know what the government is doing. Is the government following a fiscal expansion strategy? If it is, then the government is going to be increasing spending. What does that mean for my business? What opportunities are there for my business to take advantage? If the business, sorry, if the government is pursuing a fiscal contraction, they're trying to decrease spending and increase tax. What does that mean for me? Will I be paying more taxes? Will customers still buy my product? Will people have money to pay for my product? Again, these are all things for a business to consider. The role of fiscal policy and the budget it isn't just for the government, it isn't just for private citizens, it's also for businesses. Businesses will care about what the government is doing because the role the government has in the economy can influence the level of demand for the product or services sold by that business. And that very much brings us to the end of today's lecture. So again, I'll open the floor. Any questions to, from anyone? Anything you would like to ask? Today's lesson was quite difficult, guys. It's quite heavy. It's not easy to understand all the concepts I covered today. So please do ask questions if you're not sure. No? Well, okay, if there's not any further questions, I will end the session there. Thank you very, very much for your time today. Uh, Thank you.